Let me start with a word of reassurance, because although millenarianism figures in the title, I'm not going to say anything about the year 2000, the millennium of which we have been and alas still are hearing so much. The millennium that I'm concerned with is quite a different matter. Now originally, millennium it tends to be forgotten these days, but originally it was a theological term. It referred to the thousand years during which, according to the book of Revelation, Christ will reign on this earth before the last judgment. Even in the book of Revelation, this millennium has nothing to do with the year 1000 or 2000, or indeed with any particular date. And in recent years, the meaning of millenarian has been widened still further. It's become customary amongst anthropologists and sociologists, and to some extent also amongst historians, to use the word simply as a convenient label for a particular kind of salvationism. And that's how I'm using the word. Now, I must indicate, as best I can, the kind of salvationism I have in mind. The movements that I'm going to look at, they differ widely from one another, but they all have certain features in common. The salvation that they envisage is always imagined as uh, three things. Firstly, it's imagined as collective, in the sense that it's to be enjoyed by the faithful as a group. It's not a matter of individual salvation, it's a matter of collective salvation. And secondly, it's terrestrial, in the sense that it's to be realized on this earth, and not in some otherworldly paradise. And thirdly, it is total. Uh, total in the sense that it's utterly to transform life on this earth. So that the new dispensation, the millenarian dispensation, if you like, will be no mere improvement on the present lamentable state of affairs, but it will be perfection itself. Uh, that applies to, I think those three things apply to all movements that are commonly nowadays called Millenarian. It certainly applies to the ones that I'm going to consider. And of course, millenarianism in this sense, which is, of course, as I said, a broad sense, but I think it's precise enough. It's playing a great part in the world today. But there's nothing new in that. And in this talk, I'm going to consider two very different kinds of millenarian movement that flourished in Western Europe between the late 12th and the early 16th century. And when I've done that, assuming that I've still got any audience at all, I shall try to comment briefly on what seems to me to be the sociological significance of those movements. Now, the earlier of my two kinds of millenarianism is known to historians as Jerkimism. And Jerkimism was essentially a protest against the growing wealth and worldliness of the church. Uh, the way of life of the upper clergy had indeed been much changed by the great economic revival, which took place, had been gathering momentum through the 12th century. Now, after centuries when economic activity had been really very restricted, suddenly trade revived and money began to circulate in much greater quantities, and that affected the church. Popes and bishops and abbots all felt the consequences. The papacy, to start with the papacy, developed a vast system of taxation, and this in turn enabled it to behave in many ways like a great secular monarchy. A monarchy. Uh, popes uh, not only maintained splendid courts, they also hired armies, and they fought battles, and uh, sometimes won. Uh, bishops built themselves palaces where they lived in the same splendid style as other great feudal lords. 
uh, even the monasteries, many monasteries became luxurious establishments. Jerkimism developed as a protest against this state of affairs. The man after whom this movement was named, Joachim, Abbot of Fiore in Calabria, Italy, South Italy, was not consciously unorthodox. On the contrary, he never would have set down his ideas in writing at all, but for the fact that three popes in succession asked him to do so. On his deathbed, he explicitly submitted all his writings to the Holy See. And nevertheless, in the whole of the Middle Ages, there was scarcely another thinker who did so much to shake the structure of orthodox medieval theology. There were very few whose influence proved in the long run so damaging to the Church of Rome. Towards the end of the 12th century, in the, in the 1190s in other words, Joachim received a number of mystical illuminations which guided him to what he, what he believed to be the hidden meaning of the scriptures. Moreover, he was convinced that this hidden meaning, as was gradually revealed to him, provided the key to the future development of history. And on the basis of his interpretation of the Old and New Testaments put together, Joachim elaborated an interpretation of history as an ascent through three ages, each reflecting one of the persons of the Trinity. The three ages overlap with one another, they emerge from one another, and this he suggests, he said, this embodied the mystery of the Son, of Jesus, um, uh, uh, the Son emerging and the Spirit uh, emerging from the Father. No matter, the first age reflecting the Father was initiated by Adam, and that was the age of married people. Adam, after all, having set the example. The second age reflecting the Son, Jesus, began long before Jesus with the prophet Isaiah, and this was the age of clerics. Uh, that by the way, because Joachim's interest was really concentrated above all on the Third Age, reflecting the Spirit. This Third Age began to emerge already in the Age of the Father, with the appearance of the prophet Elisha. It unfolded further in the Age of the Son, with the appearance of St. Benedict. And it's to complete its unfolding in the near future. As the First Age was the Age of the Married, the Second was the Age of Clerics, so this third age was to be the age of spiritual monks. He regarded the, the Benedictines, the Benedictine order, as the nearest approach. They were the precursors of these monks-to-be. And the third age, this final, it will be the final age. It will lead to the end of the world and to the last judgment. The spiritual monks represent the absolute triumph of the spirit over the flesh. They are contemplatives, wrapped in mystical ecstasy, wholly indifferent to the things of this world. In their spirituality, he said, they are as far superior to their predecessors, the Benedictines, as Christ was to the prophets. And through their spirituality, they were going to transform the world. And with great eloquence, Joachim indicates the differences between the three ages. The first age was passed in slavish servitude, he says. The second in filial submission. But the third age will be the age of liberty. The first age was the age of fear. The second was the age of faith. But in the third age, love alone will reign. What impressed men of the 13th century was, above all, Joachim's account of how and when the world was to undergo its final transformation. And Joachim was ready for this. He computed the duration of the Second Age as 42 generations, each lasting 30 years from the birth of Christ. This meant that the Third Age must emerge from its period, as it were, of incubation and attain full development between 
1200 and 1260. There would, he said, be a time of great tribulation, that is normal with millenarian fantasies, but at the same time spiritual understanding would increase and, would fin and finally the third age would come in its fullness. Now in all this there were explosive potentialities and how explosive emerged when Joachim's doctrine became associated with the religious cult of absolute poverty. And so we come to St. Francis. But St. Francis and his first followers in the early years of the 13th century had practiced absolute poverty. They refused to own anything whatsoever. Uh, later, when that humble confraternity turned into a great order, it made concessions, as normally happens. It made concessions to the demands of everyday reality, and it acquired very substantial property. But some Franciscans refused. They refused to accept the change. They clung to the ideal of absolute poverty. These were the Franciscan spirituals. At first, they simply represented one tendency within the Franciscan order. But by the 1270s, they formed a faction which was openly at loggerheads with the superiors of the order. Early in the 14th century, the spirituals went further and broke first with the Franciscan order and then with the Church of Rome itself. Through their rigid adherence to the original ideals of St. Francis, the spirituals in the south of France and in Italy found themselves, themselves in the position of heretics. Now amongst these spirituals, Jerkemite, to come back to him, Jerkemite ideas flourished mightily. However, they were no longer the ideas of Jerkem himself, but of other writers who took over his prophecy of the coming age of the spirit they also simplified it and they gave it a twist that would have horrified Joachim. Because Joachim, as I've said, never attacked the Church of Rome. He never suggested that it was to be superseded. In his prophecies, the Church is to continue throughout the Third Age, only purified and spiritualized. The pseudo Joachimite prophecies, current amongst the spirituals, offer a very different prospect. In them, the Church of Rome is damned for its worldliness. It's to disappear and to be replaced by, guess it, by the spirituals themselves. They and they alone will lead mankind into the glories of the age of the spirit. A spiritual will mount the papal throne as Papa Angelica, the angel pope. And all this will happen in the immediate future. The fact that Joachim's own Terminus ad quem, the year 1260, had long passed, made no difference. The date was simply postponed again and again. Inevitably, the spirituals were condemned by the church and persecuted accordingly. Four were burned at Marseille in 1318. There were many more executions to follow. Equally inevitably, this persecution in turn increased the fury of the spirituals against the church. They came to see the church as the whore of Babylon, and the Pope as Antichrist. And they looked forward to the day when all the clergy would be massacred. It was a furious confrontation between a mighty established institution and small groups of radical dissenters. And yet, it was not a case of class conflict. The spirituals weren't, as has sometimes been suggested, poor peasants or artisans protesting against the socio-economic system that was exploiting them. Nothing of the kind. Originally, they were Franciscan friars, and later, when this ceased to be the case, they were drawn from townsfolk of all kinds, and not simply, or even mainly, from the poor. What, when these people condemned the wealth and worldliness of papacy and church they were protesting not against economic exploitation, but against the defection of spiritual authority. And here, I think, we are confronted with a social factor of the utmost importance, and one which must be borne constantly in mind if one is to understand the heretical sects of the later Middle Ages. In the medieval world, the church stood 
as a divinely ordained authority which with its prescriptions and demands embraced the life of every Christian. And it was the one institution which through its sacraments could offer hope of salvation after death. But in the eyes of medieval people the surest sign of grace was asceticism and the existing church had about it much uh, that was only too manifestly unascetic. Was it possible then that the church had lost its spiritual validity, had ceased to be a vehicle of divine grace? The very thought, the very possibility of doubt about so vital a matter was bound to engender intolerable anxieties. It was in response to these anxieties that sectarians of all kinds elaborated their various creeds. And in the case of the spirituals, the response took the form of a millenarian fantasy. In the view of the spirituals, the authority which had been forfeited by the existing church was to pass to a new poverty-loving church of the third and last age, represented by themselves. And as in all millenarian fantasies, the imperfect existing order was to be replaced not by one less imperfect, but by perfection itself. The age of the spirit was to be an age of supernatural bliss and harmony, while the spirituals themselves were in their own eyes almost supernatural beings, endowed with divine insight, such as had hitherto been enjoyed only by Christ himself. That's the first of my two kinds of millena medieval millenarianism, and I think you will, without much difficulty, see parallels amongst the millenarian movements of today. But it's time now to consider another form of millenarianism, which appeared towards the close of the Middle Ages, and which was revolutionary in the modern sense of the word. In part, it was derived from a very ancient idea. Already in the ancient world, it was a commonplace that once upon a time, long, long ago, human beings had lived in a state of total equality and community, holding all things in common, knowing nothing of mine or thine. Now this idea was taken over by the Catholic Church. The Church Fathers, like the pagan writers, held that this total equality was the original intention of God. From them, the idea passed to the theologians of the Middle Ages. But all this was a matter of theory. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. All, all this was a matter of theory only. It was certainly heretical preachers who, towards the end of the 14th century, were the first to try to call this egalitarian state of nature out of the depths of the past and to re represent it as an attainable ideal. And in doing so, they provided the basis for a new revolutionary form of millenarianism. From then on, the millennium could be pictured as a recreation of that lost golden age where social classes and private property were unknown. The close of the Middle Ages were accompanied by great social upheavals. These upheavals were not caused by any millenarian idea, far from it. But it is a fact that while they were taking place, there also appeared various extremist groups which really were convinced that at any moment an egalitarian communistic millennium would be established by the direct intervention of God. I looked at a couple of examples. We find such groups, for instance, in the great Hussite revolution, which broke out in Bohemia in 1419. Now here the chief preacher was one Martinek Hauska. What this man preached to his followers was that as, I quote, avenging angels of God and warriors of Christ, they must exterminate all sinners whom he identified with the nobles and the rich. When this task had been thoroughly performed, Christ would descend from heaven and establish his millennial kingdom with its center in Bohemia. And in that kingdom, all things would be held in common. In preparation for this event, the extremists amongst the Hussites actually set up a system of total community of goods, 
in the territories which they dominated. Moreover, they, pl they planned to impose this system of total community of goods on the whole world, this little group of radical Hussites. All people, they said, must always hold everything in common, and nobody must possess anything of his own. Whoever owns private property commits a mortal sin. They were resolved to extirpate that sin. They declared themselves to be, I quote, an army sent through the world to carry the plagues of vengeance and judgment upon every people that shall resist them. And after that, the sons of God shall tread on the necks of kings, and all realms under heaven shall be given unto them. That was what they looked forward to. In the event, other revolutionaries of a more practical cast of mind soon deprived these extremists of all power. And during the years of warfare that followed, while the Bohemian Hussites repulsed in battle after battle the invading Roman Catholic armies, we are no more of communal ownership. It was about a hundred years after these Bohemian upheavals that Germany witnessed two outbreaks of communistic millenarianism which have remained celebrated right down to the present day. The first of these occurred during the Peasants' War of 1525. On that occasion, a former priest named Thomas Münzer built up a revolutionary organization which he called the League of the Elect. This body, which had several hundred members, seems to have consisted mainly of urban unemployed and of workers in the copper mines. Münzer himself was a fanatical millenarian who lived in constant tense expectation of the second coming. And he, too, expected the Second Coming to restore the lost primal state of total equality and community. Moreover, he was convinced that the Second Coming would take place only when all the rich and the nobles had been killed. It was for this purpose that he trained and indoctrinated his so-called League of the Elect. In reality, the intervention of this body in the Presence War was brief and futile. It operated only for a couple of days and only in one area, Thuringia, and all it achieved was to ensure that the crushing of the Thuringian peasantry was an even bloodier business than it would have been otherwise. Now, Mincer himself was executed, but he found successors on the extreme left of the widespread religious movement which we know as Anabaptism. In the Westphalian city of Münster, in the years 1534-35, a group of radical Anabaptists succeeded in setting up a theocratic regime which was characterized by a fairly complete community of goods. What enabled them to do this was the existence in nearby Holland and Frisia of a large proletariat which was living in, in a state of perpetual insecurity. These people streamed into Münster, they soon dominated the town. Besieged by a coalition of the neighboring towns and principalities, the communistic New Jerusalem of Münster held out through incredible hardships. And in fact, it never did surrender. After part of the, of the population had starved to death, the town was stormed and all the surviving males were massacred. What gave these people the strength to endure so much was the doctrine which they had been taught by their leaders, Jan Matisse and Jan Bockelson. And the purport of that doctrine was, yet again, that Christ was about to reappear on earth and put himself at the head of the faithful of Münster. Then he and his army would kill all the great ones and establish community of goods throughout the world. What is one to make of these late millenarian movements of the 15th and 16th centuries? Certainly, there is in them a social radicalism which had not existed in the millenarian movements of earlier times. For this reason, they've sometimes been interpreted as expressions of a widespread popular craving for a totally egalitarian quasi-communistic order. By way of conclusion, I propose now to consider just how far this claim is justified. One thing at least is clear. 
When a millenarian group of this kind emerged into daylight, it was always for some, because some great revolt or revolution was in progress. This was the case every time. The bohemian extremists that I talked about operated during the early stages of the Hussite revolution. Thomas Windsor and his League of the Elect made their brief appearance during the German Peasants' Revolt, 1525. The same can even be said of the radical Anabaptists of Münster, because before they established their new Jerusalem, uh, there had already been a series of revolts, not only in that town, but all through various states round about. Um, uh, that much is generally recognized. What is not generally recognized is how little these extremist groups had in common with the mass risings to which they attached themselves. Yet the contrast leaps to the eye as soon as one considers what kind of objectives these mass movements set themselves. I'm talking now of the mass movements. What were the objectives of the Hussites? Well, they were concerned to expropriate the church in Bohemia and incidentally the German aliens who dominated that church and also to increase the status and independence of the laity as against the clergy. As for the German peasants in 1525, they were a rising, relatively prosperous class, but they were threatened by the rise of new territorial states. And their aim was to defend their traditional rights against encroachments and also, where possible, to strengthen the autonomy of their traditional communities. And if we turn to the ecclesiastical states of northwest Germany, we find that the powerful and wealthy guilds of the capital cities were striving forcefully to restrict the economic privileges and immunities of the local clergy. Well, enough of that rather tedious interlude. The point is that although these aims were not in any case realized, they were at least precise, concrete, practical. The picture presented by the millenarian groups, on the other hand, is quite different. In each case, their aims were determined not by the objective social situation, but by the salvationist fantasies of a handful of freelance preachers. And those aims were correspondingly boundless. For what these preachers offered to their followers wasn't simply a chance to improve their material a lot. It was also, and above all, the prospect of carrying out a divinely ordained mission of stupendous, unique importance. On the strength of, an, in, of supernatural revelations, the social conflict of the moment was presented as different in kind from all other struggles known to history, a cataclysm from which the world was to emerge totally transformed and redeemed. A group fighting such a battle under a divinely inspired leader, inevitably regarded itself as an elite set infinitely above the rest of mankind, infallible and above all laws. And this was indeed the case. Though their ideology was thoroughly egalitarian, in their emotional attitudes these revolutionary groups were extremely elitist. They were just as elitist as those Franciscan spirituals who had seen themselves as the only true harbingers of the Age of the Spirit. And moreover, whereas the Franciscan spirituals at least left it to God to purify the world in preparation for the millennium, these later groups felt called upon to do the job themselves by exterminating all sinners. This made them far more bloodthirsty than the larger insurrectionary movements to which they attached themselves. Again and again, the same spectacle presents itself a band of a few hundred dedicated enthusiasts struggling to master in the interests of, of its own apocalyptic fantasy a vast popular movement numbering tens or hundreds of thousands. And it wasn't simply in its aims and aspirations that the millenarian group differed from the mass movement around it. All the available evidence goes to show that it differed also in social composition. In the first place, the prophet himself. Normally he wasn't a manual worker, or even a former manual worker, but an intellectual or half intellectual. Hauska and Münzer were former priests turned freelance preachers, while Münzer 
It's known that he was born to modest comfort. He was a graduate with a voracious appetite for books. Of the prophets at Minster, one was indeed a master baker, but the more important one, Bockelson, was the illegitimate son of a village mayor. He was highly literate. He was, in fact, a failed cloth merchant. While their manifestos were composed for them by Rotman, another former priest. There's nothing here to remind one of the peasants and artisans who led the great popular risings. And indeed, wherever the career of one of these men can be traced, it turns out that he'd been obsessed by apocalyptic fantasies for many years before it occurred to him, in the midst of some great social upheaval, to address himself to the poor as possible followers. But what are those followers? They did indeed come from the poor, but it would seem from a very special kind of poor. It is most significant that all these movements flourished in areas where there existed a population which had no institutionalized means of defending or furthering its interests. I'd like to stress that that wasn't the normal situation of the medieval poor. A settled peasant or a skilled artisan might well be poor, but he was seldom defenseless. The manorial regime under which the peasants lived that determined the lives of settled peasants was by no means a system of uncontrolled exploitation. The custom of the manor, which bound the peasants, had also bound their lord. And moreover, village groups were tough, efficient organizations, very skilled in defending traditional rights, and even, if the opportunity offered, in extending them. And in the towns there were artisan guilds. These were formidable bodies, well able to cope with an obstinate overlord or a greedy petition. So settled peasants and skilled artisans did not normally find themselves in helplessly exposed situations. However, such people did not form the lower strata of medieval society. Precisely in the most populous and economically advanced areas of Europe, there existed numbers of poor folk who had no organization behind them. In the countryside, there were landless peasants and farmhands. In the towns, there were journeymen and unskilled workers. Everywhere, there was a whole floating population of beggars and unemployed. It was people such as these which provided the revolutionary prophets with their following. I see no reason to believe that there existed then any more than at any time before or since any widespread desire to abolish private property or to establish a totally egalitarian order. But in a society where all norms were being swept away, where social tensions were, were mounting, where nationwide revolts were breaking out now here, now there, in such a society, the age-old millenarian fantasies could easily be transformed into quasi-communistic ideologies. And in such a society, Millenarian sects could easily take the form of conspiratorial leagues struggling to turn each new revolt into the final worldwide, world-shattering, world-transforming cataclysm. In this sense, I believe, one may truly say that these last millenarian groups of the Middle Ages stand at the threshold of the modern world and that their story illumines some of the upheavals of our own. Turbulent century. Thank you for listening so patiently.